So a man bought a parrot, and he took it home, only to discover that the parrot had learned horrible language somewhere, and it would save that horrible language for when he had guests. It embarrassed him constantly, and uh, he frequently asked the parrot to stop, but it only got worse. One day, the last day that he was embarrassed in front of his guests, when they left, he closed the door, and he took his parrot to the freezer and put it in the freezer and closed the door. He set the timer for five minutes because he didn't want to kill it. He just wanted to get its attention. When he finally opened up the freezer, the parrot climbed out onto his arm and said to him, I am so sorry for having embarrassed you. I promise you that from now on, I will not use those kinds of words around your friends. The man asked the parrot what had caused the change, and the parrot said, While I was in the freezer, I looked around and wondered how many times the turkey had embarrassed you. (laughs) On a rather more serious note, Luke 13, 1 through 5, repent or perish. There were some present at that very time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifice, and he answered them, Do you think that those Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in that way? No, but unless you repent, you will likewise perish. Or the 18 on whom the Tower of Siloam fell and they were killed, do you think that they were worse offenders than everyone else who lived in Jerusalem? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Tonight I'm going to talk uh, not too long about repentance. Let's take a quick vote and see uh, how well educated our church is. Do you think that Repentance or faith are more important for salvation. Who thinks repentance is most important? Okay, those are action people. Who thinks faith is more important? Those are people that uh, have studied a little bit of Martin Luther, right? Salvation comes by faith through grace. That doesn't seem to include repentance, does it? So this is one of the big problems in Christianity, Is it true, do you think, that you get to go to heaven just because you intellectually conceive and assent to the basic proposition, which is Jesus was the Son of God and his death uh, erases your sins if you ask for it? That's what the majority of Christians hear the majority of the time. Where does repentance come in after that? Well, for most Christians, it never does, if the truth be told. So most people have it in their mind that whatever they've been doing, you fill in the blank. Uh, When they confess in church, right, before communion, uh, they say they're sorry. They can tell God what they've done. And and then they ask for forgiveness that they are then forgiven. Let's take a vote on that. Who thinks that all you have to do is simply confess your sin to God, be uh, genuinely sorry, and and then you're forgiven uh, and good to go. If you die that day, you go to heaven. Well, now we're a little less... Well, so, so raise your hand if you happen to have seen Jim Baker after the fall when, when he addressed his church, Jim and Tammy Faye. He seemed sincere to me, right? Tammy Faye cried all the time, so I don't know about her. But he didn't cry all the time, and he cried, and he seemed sincere, and he seemed very, very sad, and he went to prison. So he told God and his TV audience that he, that he was sorry, right? Anybody else that would listen to him, he said he was very sorry, and I'm sure that he asked for forgiveness of his sins. Do you think then that he's forgiven and ready for, fitted for heaven? Because you may or may not know he's back out doing the exact same thing again. I know, I know. That doesn't seem right, does it? What's the word for that when, when somebody says they're really, really sorry and then goes back and does the same doggone thing? A what? Backslider. Oh, I was thinking hypocrite, but backslider, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're a hypocrite, right? And, and what do non-Christians say m- with the most venom in their voice about Christians? Nothing but a bunch of hypocrites, because they hear us say, right, we're forgiven and we're going to heaven, and, and, and they want to know, well, what makes you better than me? And, and our answer is, I know the right stuff. 
So it's a problem, a big problem, not only outside for our reputation, but inside because it makes churches full of hypocrisies so bad that even Christians can't hardly stand them any longer. In this church, in the years that I've been here, um, I have really had cause to think about this and, and try to figure out what is the deal, what is the role of repentance in forgiveness. I, I read a thing this week, and, and I thought, i, I got to share that on Wednesday night. The author said, we think about it incorrectly when we think about them as different. They're two sides to the same coin. And then he listed pretty much everything that Jesus ever said about salvation, and you'll never guess what word he uses most. Repent. Not believe the right stuff. Repent, right? Repentance is, uh, I was taught as a Southern Baptist as a, a child, right, that repentance means um, that y'all should turn and walk the other way, right? So if you've been walking that way and you're a sin, sinner, then you turn around and walk the other way. What I discovered as a child is it didn't matter what direction I walked, I could figure out how to sin in that direction. Once I was ordained, you should know that all of my sinning stopped. <laughs> so if repentance is just the opposite side of the coin of faith, then repentance must mean more than just walking the other way. Repentance actually, it turns out, is a really practical aspect of faith that we don't talk about much because it doesn't draw large audiences to hear your sermon. Repentance is more than just turning and walking in a different way. It is putting yourself in a circumstance that will help you not to sin in the same way again. So in a marriage, let's say there is a horrible fight, uh, and, and during that fight, one person says to the other something that they shouldn't say and they would never have said if they hadn't gotten so angry. And later they make apologies. And the person who said the horrible thing says, <clears throat> in the future, so that I don't do that, I intend to stop and maybe even leave the room if I feel myself getting that angry again because I don't ever want to feel the shame of having said that to you again. That's repentance. So they're not only sorry for what they did and they intend not to do it again, but they're outlining a specific plan that will help take them out of the circumstance where they would do it again. So faith, right, the, the, the idea that we are saved, that our sins can be forgiven, and that they're grievous to God is great, but it's not great unless repentance is attached to it. In addiction, the difficulty of watching somebody go down the, the road of addiction is that for most people, they refuse to actually repent. So they will say they're sorry, and, they will, and they'll mean it, and they'll say they're going to do better, and they'll mean that too, but they continue to hang around the same people in the same places uh, with the same substances around and uh, with the same circumstances in their life, which means they continue to medicate no matter their intention on the days that they're sober, not if you know this to be true. So in addiction, in, in alcoholism uh, specifically, the statistics are, are these. Out of those who are, are considered to be actual uh, uh, addicts, right, uh, chemically addicted to, to alcohol, only 10% will make long-term sobriety. And uh, of that 10%, 70% will make it past 10 years. Those are withering statistics, right? So when alcoholism sets its hooks, it's a horrible thing. The people who are most likely to be able to gain long-term sobriety have one thing in common, 12 steps. And those 12 steps, if you look at them, are each one of them a type of repentance, right? So there's faith. You turn to whatever higher power you know, and you turn your life over to them. And after that, it is all repentance. You, make a, you literally go around and figure out what you've done to people, what you shouldn't have done. You make amends where, where you can, right? You restructure your life. You change your environment. You change everything you can about your life in order to put yourself in a place where the temptation and, and the recurrent uh, action of the addiction doesn't have the same chance to set into you. <clears throat> the reason that it's so hard for people to get and stay sober is it's very hard to change that depth of circumstance in your life. But repentance is meant 
to put you in a place where you can't sin anymore. The American idea is that we'll punish you until you're suitably punished and will hurt you so badly that you would never want to do that again. But it doesn't work. When you take a human being who's done something bad and you punish them out of anger, whether it's sending them to jail or beating them up or whatever it is, right? You really lay the wood to them to make sure that they learn their lesson. What do they learn? They hate you and they want to hurt you. So the punishment mode, whatever uh, theology lies behind it, the truth is when you punish someone to try to bring them to a a state of uh, no sin, it actually causes the the sin inside of them to to deepen. It exacerbates whatever problems caused the bad behavior in the first place and makes them more likely to be worse in the future than they have been in the past. And yet, as a society, we pour almost all of our money in, into that theory, right? Just throw them away, put them in jail where they hurt each other, and then, and then we let them out, they'll be all better. It, it simply doesn't work. It doesn't work in any realm to say, I'm really genuinely sorry, but I'm not going to do a doggone thing to change the circumstances that caused me to, to be a sin. Uh, Bernie Madoff, do you guys know? remember Madoff, right? He, he was the head of a big, big scheme. If he were to repent, if he were to be out of jail and and free, his repentance would need to consist of refusing to be in the financial industry. He would literally, if he wanted to repent and assure that he wasn't going to be up to the same tricks again, he would need to do something else, probably work with his hands or or something else, right? He just couldn't go go near there again. So for Christians, we have it in our mind, I believe in Jesus, I said I'm sorry, I I took communion, I'm uh, good to go. But if that's what you believe, here's what it will lead to in time. One of the secrets of our faith is how many practicing Christians actually feel like God is not personal and doesn't care about them and and they really have no interaction other than showing up in worship and and occasionally trying to pray, right? There's just a, a loneliness and God is not real to them. God is not real to them because they're in this cycle of, well, I feel really guilty and sad and I asked God to help me and God didn't do anything, right? I ended up right back doing the same stuff over again. And it is because the, the church has been cowardly in instructing people, look, the truth is, Uh, You can't earn your salvation, Christ did that, but you can't have your salvation unless it comes through repentance. It's not an earning of it, right? But you can't cash it in, you you can't make it valuable to you, you can't actually receive what Christ wants to give you unless you are willing to change your ways to assure that the sin won't occur again. I thought thought you guys would be delighted at this insight, but it doesn't really appear to be. So... Uh, you can go one of two ways. I'll leave you with two options. Uh, it, it would be great tonight if you were sitting here and thinking about somebody else who's deeply enmeshed in sin and just keeps repeating it, and uh, you could write them an email tomorrow. You could maybe even go see him personally, write him a little handwritten note saying, now I know what you need to do. That'd be swell, ineffective, but it would make you feel really good for a little while. Okay? Or you could ask yourself a simple question question. Are the things that bedevil you, the things that you wonder about yourself and and dislike about yourself, are they the result of your refusal to change the circumstances of your life to avoid repeating the sin? Chances are, they certainly are, right? That that, uh, especially the, the things that recur in your life that you wish you could stop but haven't been able to, the reason you haven't been able to, is you haven't done your part of the salvific process, which is to say, I'm going to set up my life and the circumstances of it so that the temptation is lessened or so that the opportunity simply doesn't come. Uh, When I quit smoking, I had tried for years to quit. The thing that finally helped me was a built-in consequence, right? Marilyn said, when we were first married, I can tell that you've been smoking, right? Because I thought I was being pretty sneaky, uh, uh, just having a a half a cigarette 15 times a day. And when she told me that, what I said to her immediately was, my God, thank you, right? Please, I I give you permission. If if you smell smoke anywhere around me, ask me if I've been smoking, because I care so much what you think it will be maybe what I need. And that turned out to be true. The next day is when I had the next big craving, right? And I thought about, well, what would it be like to go home and know that she can smell smoke on me, and I've never picked up another cigarette. That's a form of repentance, right? The circumstance changed so that uh, there was actual consequence for the action that no one else could give me because I didn't really care what anybody else thought. 
Repentance is a big deal, and it may be what's lacking in your life of faith. Amen.